but I'm glad you asked that question about hand washing. We need to come back to that <laughs> as a fundamental, important issue. I'm Ken Shine, uh, and uh, this uh, first panel is, uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, reminiscences with regard to the origin of the uh, effort with regard to patient safety and quality. Historically, the Institute of Medicine, like the National Academy of Sciences and now the National Academy of Medicine, has principally responded to requests for studies from outside, particularly from government, but more recently from other organizations and foundations. In the middle 90s, we were very concerned that there were important health issues which were not being addressed because sponsoring agencies weren't interested in asking about them. And so we had a retreat of our council and the heads of our boards, and we tried to look at what are the areas that we really needed to take on as an institution. We'd had a real interest in quality of care going back uh, for about 20 years, given the work of the RAND Corporation. I was at UCLA at the, at the time and worked with Bob Brook and others, and it was clear that there were really fundamental issues with regard to the, the nature of quality of care in, the, in this country. Uh, at its very best, healthcare was superb, but on average, it was mediocre. And we thought that this would be something that uh, we could take on. Uh, the council agreed. Uh, the late Walter McInerney, McInerney was chair of our uh, Council on Healthcare and Services, and he strongly supported the effort. Uh, and so we determined that we would begin an initiative in quality. And when I say an initiative, it was to be not just one study, it was to be uh, a number of studies over a period of time. Our suspicion about the interest in the community was justified when we tried to raise money to do the project. Nobody would fund it. Neither the government, nor the foundations, nor anyone else wanted to touch it. And I was repeatedly told, you mean you're gonna do a study in which you're gonna indicate to the American people that the quality of care that they get is inappropriate? You're gonna undermine the confidence of patients and their doctors and their hospitals? You're gonna do the healthcare system in? And we literally could not raise a nickel. And so over a period of three years, we saved the income from the endowment of the then Institute of Medicine, got enough money so that we could go to Bruce Alberts, who was then the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and ask him from their endowment if would they match our money. And with that, we came up with enough money to start an initiative. We started the initiative with a round table, and I've, could I get the slide? I just want to remind you that our first step was the National Roundtable on Healthcare Quality, chaired by Mark Chasen, uh, co-chaired by Bob Galvin. You can see the people who were on this uh, roundtable. They were superb individuals. And they were able to come up with a report which at least said, yes, we can measure quality. And that they provided some parameters, underuse, overuse, dis misuse, a variety of ways of saying, the, this was something that could be approached, although many people were at that time deniers. But we recognized that we needed to go farther than that, and the next thing we did was to establish the Committee uh, on Quality. Could you have the next slide, please? The Committee on Quality of Healthcare in America, and you've already seen this list. It's a very distinguished uh, group, uh, and we charged them uh, with continuing this initiative and coming up with a report. There were a number of features of this which were unique. In addition to the fact that this was a self-initiated, self-funded project, uh, that we were venturing into an area in which, in fact, at that time was rather unpopular. Uh, we also said that we wanted the committee to come up with a report which would be accessible to the general public, uh, that there would be significant resistance in the medical professions in the health professions to the notion that their quality was in, inappropriate. And we would have all kinds of arguments about could it be measured, could it not be measured, and so forth. And so we did something relatively unique. We hired a public relations firm uh, and said that whatever report we got, we were gonna disseminate in a very unusual way. And under the leadership of uh, our staff director, project director, uh, we organized a one-day workshop with the print media, 
uh, and, the, and the electronic media and said, we want to take on this issue of quality. Uh, how can we go about doing it in a way that would inform the public? They said, stop. Don't even talk about quality. Quality is something that Ford Motor Company is now using in order to combat the Japanese success in selling cars. And Ford Motor Company is talking about quality. People aren't going to believe that their doctor doesn't provide the highest quality or that their hospital isn't the greatest quality. You need another hook. And we took that back to the committee, and there was the basis for looking at medical errors. Medical errors were clear. They could be identified. There were newspaper articles at the time about wrong-sided surgery. Uh, if you talk to a physician about whether he or she had seen an error, they had to admit that such errors existed. And so we moved from talking about quality to talking about patient safety and errors. The interesting thing about it is that although we were not able to get additional funding for the Quality Chasm Report, uh, during that period of time, there was a renewed interest in seeing what our next report was going to be after we brought out to Air is Human. Hiring the public relations firm was a remarkable advance because the demands on the committee, uh, as it turns out, were spectacular. And you'll hear in a moment about uh, how those demands develop. But the point is that this was a relatively unusual uh, activity in which it was self-initiated, self-funded, designed to impact uh, the public as well as the professions and academia, uh, organized in such a way that we have media communications in a, in a big way. We have with us four members of that committee uh, who will be commenting about their experience. Um, to, me, to, me, to, my, to my left, obviously, is, is uh, Don Berwick, uh, who, as you know, went on to be, be an extremely important leader of CMS. All their bios are available to you, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but also as the founder of IHI, clearly has had a profound effect on quality. Sitting next to him was the great discovery, if you will, of this initiative, <laughs> Janet Corrigan. She was the program director of this for half a dozen years and presided over many of the reports that Dr. Zhao showed you. She is an extraordinary individual who not only led uh, this committee's activities along with the chair, uh, but went on to become the president of the National Quality Forum and a, a variety of other things. The chair of the committee was Bill Richardson. And he was an unusual choice from the point of view of many people working in the field. He was then the president of the Kellogg Foundation. It was not in the quality field at all, but we felt we needed a wise person as chair, not somebody who had credentials in the field, but someone who could help to move what was a controversial area forward in a meaningful way. And to his left is Lucian Leap. Lucian had for uh, well over 15 years been a leader in identifying problems with medical errors and safety. And his work was an important part of the transition of a study on quality to one looking at patient safety and medical errors. Well, with that little bit of background, let me turn to the group. We have a limited amount of time if we're going to stay on <laughs> schedule. So I'm going to turn first to Bill Richardson, the chair, and ask him to comment on how this very distinguished group of people, and as you look at their names, you recognize many of the things that they went on to do uh, after this activity, but ask Bill to comment about how they went about this and what the issues were. Bill? Sure. Thanks, Ken. Let me start just by noting some of your er earlier observations, uh, which are so critical. Uh, I, th I think the way it was formed had a lot to do with the success of the committee and the way it was overseen. It was very, very, very effective, I thought. Um, I was sort of surprised. Actually, I was the president of Johns Hopkins at the time. And this was so before that, the Kellogg, yeah. So that just raised the, everyone's nervousness on the campus right there. <laughs> but to your first point about suspicion of the whole thing, my chief of surgery father-in-law and my brother-in-law, who was a very active internist, and my brother, who's a pediatrician, 
Paul said, you're, you're going to do what? <laughs> 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 Just as the, as the reaction that you got. Are you, are you going to, you know, sort of tear down medicine even more than it's already being torn down? And it's been fascinating to watch this over the last 15 years or so and see how they have bought in to uh, the kinds of things that we've come up with. And I think more generally speaking, that's happened. But a lot of work had been done, as Ken suggested. We, the committee, when it gathered, uh, many knew each other. We had a pretty good idea of what the issues are. We didn't know how to analyze it, how, how, to, how to get further information that we could use and rely on, and then how to pull it together in a way that would make an impact. Our biggest fear, I would say at the beginning, was we'll do all this work, which essentially pulled together all the information that was already available from the substantial work that had been done up to that point, and sort of pull it together in a way that would have an impact on the country, on citizens, on the government, and so forth. And so we thought long and hard about that. And actually, at the beginning, we had the idea of one report, which was crossing the quality chasm. And the, the errors came along a, a little bit later because we were so aware of the, the uh, degree to which the public and the professions uh, and, and the uh, health system uh, participants were, were thinking about this as something that wasn't a, a big threat or a, bi a big worry. You know, we were, all, we were sort of overblowing it uh, to some degree or, or, or could be. And as we went along, uh, there was increasing recognition that as we reframed it, yeah, there really was something going on. And the reframing was, just to elaborate a little bit on what Ken said, the idea of it being a, a, a quality program, a performance program, for the system as a whole, and a systems program, or a systems challenge, uh, for that matter, was foreign to people. I mean, the, the general belief was that medical errors came about because of impaired physicians. And it wasn't their training, obviously. The training was terrific, and same for nursing. Uh, so there had to be something wrong. And the, my impression at the time was that both from a policy perspective and from a professional perspective, the issue really was, on the one hand, safety in the sense of cleanliness and orderliness and so on, which had, and, and fire safety and things like that on the one hand, and impaired physicians on the other. And that was sort of the root of the, of the problem. And so neither of which we felt you know, was legitimate. But as an example, uh, my own congressman, Fred Upton, who's now, as you know, quite senior in the, in the House, but he, had, he was working on a proposal uh, that would require the states to share information on impaired physicians. And would that, would that take care of the problem? I said, Fred, it won't even touch the problem. I mean, it's a good thing for you to do, but I mean, this, it's just a speck on, on the bigger issue of quality of care and, and safety. And I think it played out that way in the profession, too. There was a lot of, I wouldn't call it paranoia, but there was a lot of concern on individual physician behavior, and, and particularly impaired physician and nurse behavior. And that turned out to be a relatively minor part of the whole thing. Obviously, it was structural in all the things that you see from the reports. And so as the committee went along, we sort of thought hard about the segregation of it between quality of care and medical errors. And because they were quite different, and I think from our perspective, the quality of care component of it was the, was the heavyweight, and the, and the medical errors, not so much so. But as we thought about it, the idea of doing medical errors first, we thought, would be, would be not just interesting, but attention grabbing, as you suggested, and would get people alert to what was happening and wondering what was happening mm -hmm. and being interested. And it was simple to understand. Mm -hmm. and, it, it, and I think the most important thing that came out of it was that contrary to what almost everybody believed, it had nothing to do with impaired physicians. Not nothing. It had relatively little to do with impaired physicians and had largely to do with the systems uh, elements of it. And so we thought about it in systems terms I uh, used a few, you know, analogies, loosely speaking, you know, like, for example, the, the airlines and the like, and what kinds of things that they do. Mm -hmm. And out of that then came what we thought was going to be one report, but ended up being two reports. And we decided to go with the medical errors report first, because that was the one that, would, as Ken said, would catch people's attention, and they'd follow up on what work we were doing after that. And as I went around and talked to groups at the end of my time as chair, um, 
medical staffs were, were really, they got it. And several, when I've talked to groups, I'd have two or three or four uh, members of the medical staff stand up at the end of the talk and, and say, well, you won't, you won't find anything like that here. <laughs> and the, the, I mean, that's not surprising. But the extraordinary part was, everybody else in the room would say, oh, come on, Ed, you know perfectly well that that goes on. <laughs> so there's almost, almost a buy-in to it by the time we were finished. It was it took very a, rewarding. It took a fair pen to, uh, amount of time for the buy-in to take place. Oh, sure. Yeah. And in many cases, it stimulated studies in those institutions, which in fact discovered yeah. that they had. And I think one of the remarkable things in the evolution of the of area was the way in which individual physicians recognized problems and became major champions. Mm -hmm. Janet Corrigan was uh, the key staff person in this activity uh, and uh, will testify to the fact that although we got no outside money for Tahiris Human or the Chasm, once those were published, there were resources and she went on to lead a number of other studies. But when you became a project director, what were your expectations of this activity and how did it work out from your perspective? Um, my goal really in, in taking on this, uh, this project was, and working with so many wonderful experts in the field was to be able to get a very, very broad message out on, on how serious this problem was and that it needed to be a national priority. We had had, as, as you've heard, putting it in context, numerous other reports that came out. The President's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection and Quality had just issued a, a major report um, before this effort commenced. Uh, kind of putting out, uh, you know, the call to action and how uh, what, how large the quality gap was. Uh, so it really was to try to figure out how to galvanize effort, how to engage many, many different stakeholders. It was clear that we needed to get outside the healthcare sector in the message. The message needed to go out and engage people on Capitol Hill and state houses, the business community, and it needed to reach the American public at large. So that was a very different task uh, than I think taking on. Um, uh, uh, an effort to, you know, review the evidence and, uh, you know, state the way that the situation is. We really knew that we had to reach a very broad audience if we were going to get the kind of attention paid to this issue that was absolutely critical. And, and, and as you've heard, you know, I think having the early uh, input from the communications uh, experts was critical. And, and they, they told us three things. They told us that uh, the quality reports are real thumb suckers. They put everybody to sleep. And, you know, we had to come up with something that was understandable and would catch attention. And we worked very hard, you know, to use the, uh, the statistics and the numbers, I think, to be able to capture people's attention. It was helpful to have the 44,000 to 98,000 potential deaths. That was critical because people could get their arms around it. And, and to be able to say this is more than motor vehicle accidents and AIDS and, you know, uh, others combined, they, they, they understood it was a big, a big deal and something they needed to pay attention to. But the other thing I think that challenged us in this effort is we also heard that what people, uh, what, what those in the media like to write about are stories where there's a villain and a victim. And we said, well, we got lots of victims, or lots of, but we don't have any villains. I mean, we, don't, we have victims, but we don't have villains. And that caused us, I think, or, or encouraged us to look much deeper into the systems issue uh, and how we would frame this uh, and, and, and really explain to people uh, that there really weren't any villains in the effort. But the third thing that was important from this, this project was that we also heard you have, it has to be actionable. You have to tell different stakeholders and groups what they can do to make it better. Yeah, don't just tell them there's a problem. Um, give them a direction for what they can do next. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the, the to air as human had in it were specific recommendations, uh, you know, that, that uh, Congress should do certain things, allocate dollars for safety, uh, you know, make it a central focus, set up a safety group, uh, that there needed to be reporting systems. You know, there were tasks for state governments, for federal governments, for uh, the business community and for consumers at large and, and the health professions. And that, I think, helped to really move it forward. So this exceeded my expectations, uh, and, and I, I hoped that when I start, got into the project uh, that we would be able to uh, get the message out and draw greater attention to it, uh, but it exceeded my expectations uh, that we really did have a, a sizable splash. And it set a wonderful floor uh, for the Quality Chasm Report, which didn't have as broad an audience. It really was more of a report directed at the healthcare community. But the first step was, was critical. Janet and I were uh, reminiscing this morning that uh, 
when the numbers came out, there were enormous challenges to those numbers. The fact is that we knew that we'd only been looking at a narrow window in terms of certain inpatient studies. We weren't looking at outpatient. We look, weren't looking at nursing homes, et cetera, et cetera. So we knew the numbers were larger. But the thing that we particularly were amused by and, and presented problems were a couple of studies by academics confirming the number of patients involved, but arguing that a substantial number of them would have died in the next six weeks or eight weeks, and that this was thing happening at the end of life. And our response to that was, if I've got six weeks to live, please don't shut my six weeks off by making a mistake. Uh, but the point is that we had lots of conflicts. Lucian Leap, as I mentioned, had been working uh, in the vineyards here on uh, safety for a long time. Lucian, what were your expectations? And from your perspective, what's been the impact of this study on the field that you've been so much a leader of? Um, I was very skeptical. Um, I remember clearly, um, I almost decided not to be on this committee. Uh, Mara, Do Do Mara Donaldson called me and said they were forming this committee. And I said, oh, Mara, I've been on IOM committees. And I said, they're wonderful, but nobody, you know, they write these reports and nobody does anything. And I said, I'm pretty busy, I'm not sure. And so she told me who was on the committee when you can see this list. I said, well, hmm, it'd be kind of fun just to go talk with people like that. Maybe I'll do it. Uh, and then one thing led to another, uh, so to speak. But uh, I think when the report came out, we were all both optimistic and a bit cynical. We'd all had that experience of, of doing, um, writing great reports and, and having them not have much impact. I think we had a sense this was different, that this was really big time, and that we were onto something that was uh, really of, of very fundamental importance. But uh, we weren't at all clear uh, whether the public would see it that way. And, um, and I was amused because the data we were using was from a study we had done nine years previously. And when that data were published then, uh, it had no impact, which is a very good example. It's not what you say, it's who says it. And when the IOM says it, people listen. And uh, I think the combination of having uh, those outrageous numbers, outrageous to, to the people who heard them for the first time, and the message that um, it's not bad people, it's bad systems, um, really turned out to be very powerful. I remember um, getting goosebumps when we sat in the, in the Rose Garden and heard the President of the United States say, we know it's not bad people, it's bad systems. I said, he got it. And, 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 and a lot of people got it. They weren't quite sure how to do it, but the idea turned the whole conversation around, as Bill said, from bad doctors to bad systems. So we were cautiously optimistic, uh, particularly after the initial reaction, that there might indeed be a lot of ac activity and a lot of action. And indeed, Congress started having hearings fairly shortly after that. So uh, I think we, we were pretty high at the time about, about seeing things happen. And, and indeed, I think it's fair to say that our basic message is not bad people, it's bad systems, really did get through. I mean, I think people really do get that. And, uh, and I think uh, that there were some clear, tangible products, not nearly as much as we called for, not nearly as much as we wanted to see, but certainly under John Eisenberg's direction, the Agency for Health Research and Quality really got moving on a, a, to establish the Center for Patient Safety, and they've done a tremendous amount of work with very inadequate resources. Um, so I think overall, uh, we got our message through, and we got to see some action, and uh, none of it's been nearly as much as we like, but a good start. And there, there was, in fact, an appropriation of $50 million mm -hmm. uh, to implement patient safety About activities. We're going to pay tribute to John Eisenberg, the late John Eisenberg, just before we go to lunch, because uh, he not only was important as far as ARCA is concerned, but the consortium within the federal government to work uh, in multiple institutions. And even today, HHS, as Mary Wakefield who's the interim deputy uh, secretary pointed out last night, is very actively incorporating issues of safety uh, in many, many of their programs. So it's, it's had a residual under 
those circumstances. Uh, Don, you've been following this activity and in fact have been involved in a subsequent report uh, by the National Safety Foundation uh, uh, just this week. Uh, what was your take on what happened? Uh, what, what might we have done differently that might have produced a better result or a different result? And where do you think we are at the present time? Um, yeah, the, the National Patient Safety Foundation report um, is called uh, Free from Harm, and it's just out yesterday, and it, it's the next 15 years speculated about. This was one of the peak experiences for me my whole career. I just can't be up here without acknowledging Ken's courage and getting it started and Janet's brilliance in, 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 in the engine of the report and Bill's uh, artistry as a leadership of a, a group of narcissists and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and, and Lucian's scientific input. I mean, this was this was an incredible moment. Uh, I th reflecting, th I just have to tell a quick story, which was uh, the timing here. So Janet, uh, Janet is the person that did the forty-four to ninety-eight thousand calculation. I know because she called me one night and said, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Uh, she was extrapolating from the Colorado and Utah study and the Harvard medical practice study, and so that sounds good, and so we went ahead with it. Uh, the report was due out on a Wednesday. That was when the press conference was set. It leaked on Sunday, and Lucian and I got a phone call on Sunday night saying, get down to Washington, we're gonna go fast, and, and, that, and that we actually issued it on a Monday. Wednesday was when the World uh, Trade Organization protest blew up in Seattle and became front page news. It, it's, it's breathtakingly random that we happened to get the window, and I often have nightmares of what would have happened had we actually uh, not been yeah. forced to move quickly. Yeah. It, it changed everything. Uh, IHI started 10 years before this report, and we were working on the sidelines of care. This report centered, it just, it just moved the action into the center uh, to Ares Human and then the CHASM report. So it, this was a transformative step for healthcare. It also was global. Uh, because the, what, the cascades that happened almost immediately in other countries to, to pick up this, this, uh, this agenda, it was, it, was, um, it was amazing. The other thing that happened was scientists of systems and, and safety came into healthcare. Jim Reason, Charlie Vincent, uh, David Woods, <laughs> Carl Weick, these people became interested in healthcare, and I think it was catalyzed by the report. And um, it, 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 was a, it was a turning point. Uh, I th if I go back, what do I wish we'd done differently? The cup is more than half full here. I, I, it's easy in retrospect. The things that I would say uh, I, I, I wish we had known, uh, we, we, we talked about culture, but we didn't understand right. quite how right. phenomenal a barrier whatever you want to talk, the habits of behavior and belief are, they're, they're, just, they're just massive. And I think we underestimated the importance of the research endeavor, the engineering science endeavor. Uh, Jerry Grossman was there and he spoke to this, but uh, this is a science and, and, and we, 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 sh we could have gone, gone further and we are now and, and, and the sciences here are crucial, not just in healthcare, the continuing bridge to other safety industries is important. I guess it, error, it was a good word to use, it was charismatic, it's not actually the right problem. The problem is injury, not error. And, 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 and it's, been a, it's really been a long process to try to refocus. It's not the avoidance of error that's the issue here. You can't avoid errors, they happen. Listen to Dan. What happens is you can mitigate the effect of error and reduce their, their frequency, but the real focus needs to be on, in, on, on, on injuries to people and how to intercept them, and the only one of those is reducing error. It actually may not even be the biggest part of the, pro of the opportunity. We overstated reporting. I think we've had 15 years of, 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 of uh, f festive reporting of errors. <laughs> Enough. You know, we, <laughs> reports are important. You need the information. It's a cultural issue, but the massive reporting systems are, are not the answer. We didn't know that. We didn't have patients on the committee. If we were going to do it today, we, I'd have injured patients and, and loved ones uh, right at the start on the committee. And the last thing that I'll say is um, it's, it's very controversial and other speakers today will probably disagree with me and they may be, well be right, but we made a choice to divide safety from the larger quality agenda. Several of you mentioned that. Okay, but it's actually uh, technically not quite correct. 
uh, injuries and safety are part of the larger issue of systems and what they do, which involve everything that was listed, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equitable care, now population health. And, and so what happened was, in England, there was a national patient safety agency and a modernization agency. In the U.S., we had the National Patient Safety Foundation and other quality, and then organizations that work on patient-centeredness. There, there's a unification here, which has to do with thinking about excellence across the board and, and, and unifying our efforts to become everything we want to be in which safety is part of that. And I, I think maybe the next step is a reunification of systems thinking. Uh, and and I, th I think we can get there. I think Peter's work, Peter Pronovo's work on total system excellence is really very much in the spirit of where we need to be moving now. I, I would echo your comments about the fact that the report brought a number of extraordinary people into the field who might not otherwise have done it. Peter Protovos is a good example, but he, he commented last night that it was a generational phenomenon in terms of that. Uh, your comment about metrics, uh, President Zhao talked about numbers. Uh, I don't know what to make of those numbers. The, de the definition changes, uh, what, what uh, the, the denominator is changes all the time. So I echo, I, I, I resonate with your comments about not necessarily focusing on the numbers to the extent that we need to focus on the principles. This, of course, is a celebration of this report. It's a celebration of the work of this committee, of the staff. Uh, Mala Donaldson and Linda Cohn really helped uh, yes. uh, Janet a great deal in making this happen. But in the last couple of minutes, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to shorten the break a little bit, but uh, try to get us back close to, to on schedule. Uh, but before we conclude, uh, I would just ask each of the, the members here to make one comment about what they think the highest priority would be going forward in terms of both improving quality of care and patient safety. And I, my, my logic, uh, 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 Don, was that many of the principles which had to do with s safety were principles that were part of quality so that it did advance that to a certain extent. But uh, if you were to, uh, starting with you, Don, if you were to say, this is what I would particularly like to see f focused on in the future in order to improve health care, what would be the, the item that you would want to see us focus on? I'll grab two. Uh, governance is one. This, the, the, the boards of trustees at, of any kind of organization must feel responsible for this, and they don't yet. And until that happens, it's really hard to get systemic thinking. The other is academia. We, we, we're, we're, we're making progress, but let's leap now so that the preparation to be a professional of any stripe includes thorough immersion in the skills to become a citizen and improvement of all types. It's not in the, it's not in the curricula yet, and it, and it needs to be central. Well, it's interesting. We haven't been making some progress. Uh, mm -hmm. The University of Texas now uh, safety, quality improvement is part of the undergraduate curriculum as well as the residency. And I also would point out there are a number of hospital systems in which there is a member of the board who is in fact responsible for quality and, and safety. It's not universal by any means, but I think there's been some progress in governance. Yes. We need to do a lot more. Uh, Janet, what would you say? I'd like to see us really focus a lot of attention on payment systems. I think we just don't have it right. As we heard, pay for performance isn't the right uh, <coughs> system uh, for individual clinicians and others, but I think we need a massive redesign of our payment programs. They don't allow resources to flow where they need to flow to build high-performing health systems. They don't reward the kind of institutions that are providing the safest, um, highest quality care, and there needs to be a much better alignment than there is they're unnecessarily complex uh, um, with, with payment programs at all different levels, many of them still based on services as opposed to outcomes. We really need to overhaul payment. It is integrally related to the ability to provide safe and effective high quality care. Uh, the other area though that I think that, that we're now starting to focus a lot of attention on, which was a little bit of a missed opportunity in the CHASM report, uh, a bit more of a focus on population level outcomes and the integration between health care and social services, mm. um, all of the, uh, the supports in the community that need to be there to be able to get the best outcomes and the best health of the population. Bill? There's been a lot of restructuring and mergers and combinations and systems and sort of a different way of thinking about mm -hmm. things than there was at the time that we had the 
committee. And I think trying to link that and focus that on an understanding of where we want to be in the context of the report and, and other things will be very important. And I think governance, as Don suggests, is a real key to that. And I know that the uh, organization that I'm on the board of has a tremendous focus on that at the board level with a committee that really pays attention and understands uh, you know, where we need to be going. But if you think about mergers and acquisitions and communities and scale and all of those sorts of issues that are naturally developing or have developed, uh, as long as they're on track with what it, where it is we're trying to go, which isn't necessarily just staying alive, is it's very important to have this be the center of attention, I think, in the decades ahead. Thank you, Bill. Lucian? Um, I'm a surgeon, so I tend to think in terms of action that will make a difference. Uh, I want to second what, what Don said, and that is the, probably the biggest area we were missing when we came out with this report was a recognition of how profound the cultural problem was. That this was what we were calling for was really going to require very major culture change in a very dysfunctional culture. Healthcare organizations are among the most dysfunctional in the world in, in many ways. And we just sort of, we didn't really even talk about that very much. And that, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what we could have done about it, but we should at least have talked about it. But that is the problem, and I don't share your enthusiasm about the boards, having been on a few and realizing how ineffective they are. And it seems to me the organizations that have really made progress have made it because of the leadership, the CEO, who then brought the board along. He had to have a supportive board, of, cl of course. And I think our biggest problem is that we don't have the CEOs aboard, and that we, what we need is a very major effort to educate, motivate, incentivize, fill in the blanks, to get the CEOs, the leaders, the leaders of our healthcare systems to really make patient safety quality number one and make the cultural changes that are necessary to do that. I don't know how you do that, but money would help. And if we could get some really significant support for patient safety in the range of a couple hundred million dollars a year instead of the, the pittance that that ARC has to use for this, that would help. And then I have a suggestion that nobody likes, and I wish we really had put it in the report, is we really ought to have a federal patient safety agency like the FAA. Now, you and, all, you and I all know that this Congress is not going to do that, but that's what we need, and we should have said that, and I'll say it right now. We should have a federal <laughs> patient safety agency, full stop. Very good. Uh, you'll notice that I asked them for one idea, and it's an outstanding group. <laughs> they all provided two. Uh, I, I concur with all of the uh, recommendations. I would just add one as an educator who's responsible for medical education. Um, we are now going through a transition in our healthcare system uh, toward an increasing amount of uh, team care, whether it's health homes, accountable care organizations, a variety of other techniques. Uh, in the, there's major initiatives now by the American Association of Medical Colleges, others, on interdisciplinary professional education in which you bring nursing students, pharmacy students, medical students, social workers, others together, have them learn, have them do projects and so forth. Patient safety and quality is one of the few areas which resonates with all of those groups and where you can really bring together the notion that it is a system of care, that all of these players are part of that system. And I would like to see a real emphasis on the notion that as we evolve this new team-based healthcare system, that in fact it is a system and that patient safety and quality of care is an intrinsic part of that activity. Um, we have four very interesting panels, and so, and I want to give them adequate time today. We are going to take a 20-minute break. We're going to start promptly at 10.15 with our next panel. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary contribution made by the Committee on Quality of Healthcare in America, as well as the Roundtable. We really have a great deal to celebrate. The idea that when we brought out these reports, that you could still open any journal and find the first paragraph in some article making reference to the importance 
of patient safety and things of this sort, I think is a tribute to their contribution. And we want to celebrate that activity. At the same time, we have an enormous amount that still has to be done. And the meeting today, we hope, will be a transition where we can get ideas, just as Dan Ariely gave you some notions about thinking differently about how we motivate and how we influence physician behavior. We're hoping that you're going to get a combination of information from wise academicians who study quality, but also from people from a variety of other disciplines. So we're looking forward to a very exciting meeting. We're adjourned and we'll reconvene at 10.15. Thank you. Great.